Welcome, one and all, to the Cool Words Podcast with me, your host, David Kipping. This week is my pleasure to be joined by Professor Lisa Kautenegger. She is not only a professor at Cornell University, but also the director of the Carl Sagan Institute. Yes, you heard that right, Carl Sagan, who is, of course, a hero to myself and I think many other astronomers, including, I'm sure, many listeners out there. So, you know, this institute, it is a unique place because it's highly interdisciplinary and it's trying to bring together scientists who are approaching the question of the search for life in the universe from all different directions, from chemistry, biology, and of course, astronomy. Now, Lisa has just written this book. It's called Alien Earths. I had the chance to read an advanced copy of it. I really enjoyed it. And so I thought we should talk about this book, get Lisa onto the podcast and hear about what inspired her to write this book. What is the latest in the search for life in the universe? And her thoughts about a couple of controversial topics that we get into, such as Venus, whether there is potentially life on Venus, and also a recent claim from the James Webb Space Telescope that has been interpreted by some as potentially a claim for life as well. So we'll get into all of that juicy gossip plus a lot more. Please do enjoy my conversation with Lisa Kautzenegger. Lisa, thank you for joining me today on the Cool Wars podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to have you. We've obviously known each other for a long time in the field and seen each other at many conferences. I've been to Cornell many times. I think this is your first time at Columbia, is that right? That's actually true. And it's crazy, right? It's just so close by. So hey, you're your neighbor practically over at practically. Cornell. And I guess, you know, there's a lot to talk about with you today. You're obviously an expert in the search for life in the universe, astrobiology, exoplanets. You've written this wonderful book that we'll be talking about today called Alien Earths that um, I had a, a blast reading and I want to definitely talk about that. But I thought we should start just for the sake of the audience of introducing your origin story and your beginnings as a scientist. I know you can go really far back with this, like you grew up in Austria and were inspired by the sky at that point. But I think your first real work as a scientist was with this, exp with this proposed experiment, Darwin. There was an ESA mission. So maybe you could start by telling us about how you got into that, what Darwin was, and what its legacy has maybe become. So I was kind of curious about everything. I think a lot of people are. And so when I studied studying, I was picking a couple of different fields just to make sure that I wouldn't regret not studying something. So I ended up with about five different things. And in the end, astronomy and physics, so physics for engineering and astronomy were the two things that I finished. And that turned out to be a perfect combination for getting a spot um, the European Space Agency, I'm European, has this program for young scientists and engineers. And it was actually close because the other thing I wanted to do was cancer research. And so I had done some practice there in the United States, actually, I came back and it's like, okay, I'm going to apply two things. One is going to be this internship for cancer research in France. And the other one is going to be this one mission, the mission that could find life on another planet at the European Space Agency. And the way it works is usually you tick like all the boxes of all the missions you would want to work on. And I was like, that one. I want to find life in the universe or I'm going to uh, look at the medical field because I think that's fascinating as well. And so then uh, there was this mission, it was called Darwin. After it, Charles Darwin, I guess. After Charles Darwin yeah. to find life in the universe. And now we like back about 20 years at least. But the idea was that it would have flown actually in 2017. So when <laughs> so, I was starting working on seven this, years ago, great. I know, seven <laughs> yeah. years ago. So about 25 years ago, it would have flown roughly. But when I was starting, we had the design for this mission that could find planets and then also catch enough lights of these planets to figure out if there's something in the atmosphere of these other worlds that could identify life. And it is really tricky because you want a unique signature. When you look back at the Earth, the combination of oxygen or ozone with a reducing gas like methane tells you that there's life on our planet. And it has to be the combination. One is not enough because oxygen and methane go and make CO2 and water in the long run. So if you see oxygen while there's methane still around, 
that means something produces those two gases in big quantities. And for the oxygen part, that's life. And so what's really interesting is I started with the Darwin mission. I started on the design on this mission that was a big, big telescope. How big it, was it? It was actually supposed to be a flotilla of telescopes. Okay. So instead of having one big one, we would have three or four telescopes that work together in combination. Oh, so interferometer? Interferometer okay. to basically find yeah. these signs. And the way that works, what's really fun, is when you have a couple of smaller telescopes, you can mimic a big one. And the big problem is that we don't have a rocket where you can actually put a big telescope in and launch it into space. So if you could go into interferometry where these telescopes work together, you could actually put a much bigger telescope into space because you could just fly six of those or four smaller telescopes. And that was the Darwin mission. And so there was a lot of fun engineering things as well, in addition to uh, what could you look for. And so we were doing this trade-off of, do you need three telescopes? Do you need four? How would you do this? How would you combine the light precisely enough to not miss the signs of life? And while I was working, so I was working half as an engineer and half as a scientist, and I was doing my PhD basically at the European Space Agency. I was doing my PhD basically at the European Space Agency, finding out what the design should be and how that would help us find signs of life. And one of the things that puzzled me, and I think this happens a lot when you actually deep dive into a problem. I was like, so what are we looking for? And what we were looking for was modern Earth. So 21% oxygen with methane. And I was like, but we do know that the Earth changed throughout its history. And we do know that there was life for about at least 3.5 billion years out of the 4.6 billion that the Earth was around. And so we didn't have any idea of what to look for, of what to look yeah. for if the Earth was younger. You can only look for Earth as it is today. And we'll get into this because I know you, it, I've seen your book, you talk about this a lot about how Earth has changed so much, which is amazing to think that how transient the, the current era of the Earth really is. And so you were asking for the origin story, right? So yeah. basically working on this design of this mission, trying to figure out how to best spot signs of life in the universe. That's when I started to puzzle. It was like, why are we only looking for a carbon copy of current Earth? Even if it were just a little bit younger or a little bit older, the signs probably would change. Like for younger, we know now roughly what it was. And so I was talking to everyone I could find, telling them that they needed to model this. And so the problem was it's a really hard problem. And I didn't know that because I had never modeled a planet before. And there was this opportunity when I was meeting somebody at a conference that was Wesley Traub at Harvard University. And he was like, well, if you think that's something that's important to do, you'd have to go and do it. And I was like, me? You know, because I was like, well, I've never modeled a planet before. And he was like, well, you can learn, right? And I was like, okay. So Darwin had, you know, was this uh, incredibly ambitious project then. It was trying to take a photo of another planet, including Earth's, which are obviously the hardest type of planet of all the exoplanets we've found to try and go after. And that's still not something we really achieved, right? We don't have any images of pale blue dots except for our own. Yeah. And what was the what was the legacy? Do we have any missions since then that have been proposed to do this? And where are we at with the idea of achieving that? What's kind of crazy when I think back, I just finished my master's thesis. I was looking for a PhD project and I found this opportunity at the European Space Agency to work on the design of this mission that would look at other worlds like ours, so small and at the right distance to be warm, to look for signs for life. And there was nothing like it. Meaning we had never thought about how to do this before. They were the first ideas of how we could design it. It was called the Darwin mission that the European Space Agency, so Europe, and it was called the Terrestrial Planet Finder at the NASA side. So there was a counter group basically on the US side who was doing a same analysis of how we could do this. And so just fresh out of university, just finished a master's degree, but because I had an engineering and a science degree, they were like, we were looking for somebody. And I had specialized in optics 
and in bioengineering. So it kind of fit what they were trying to do. And so we were going through this groundwork, trying to figure out how we could combine these telescopes to catch light from such tiny planets. Because if you put the Earth 110 times next to each other on a string, that's the diameter of the sun. So we have a huge problem engineering wise and in addition, science-wise, trying to find signs of light in this tiny, tiny atmosphere of the planet. And so let's say you have 100 times the Earth next to each other, that's the diameter of the sun. But where you're trying to find these signs of life is in the air. And so if you take the Earth and you just basically make it the size of an apple, the atmosphere where these particles are, where these chemicals are that we could look for, is actually thinner than the peel of the apple. And that's what you're trying, engineering-wise, to get enough light from to actually see this. And so Darwin and the terrestrial planet finder were the first steps. And they were seen as too ambitious. We had technology in place. We we're like, well, if we can do it this way, we can sample like 10, 20 planets to look for signs of life. But that far back, it was supposed to fly in 217, just as a reminder, we didn't know how many planets there were out there. Kepler hadn't launched yet. Kepler hadn't found planets yet. And so we were doing this all on an assumption of, you know, one out of 10 planet, one out of 10 stars would have a planet that could be like the Earth. And what's really great, and on the other hand, a little frustrating, is that Kepler actually showed us that it's even better than that. So one out of five has a planet that's at the right distance and small enough that it could potentially be like another Earth. And so we were actually over conservative, if you want to think about it, with the Darwin and the TBF mission. But on the other hand, we designed something hoping that there would be enough planets for us to look at. And so it makes a lot of sense that we needed Kepler as the building step, as the stepping stone to then now come back and propose a similar concept again, like the terrestrial planet finder or Darwin. And so these two missions are basically in Europe, they have a mission called LIFE that is um, revisiting this idea of using more than one telescope, mm -hmm. combining the light and finding signs of life. So in the U.S., when every 10 years astronomers come together and decide what is really important to do next, we came up with an idea of revisiting this concept. And the U.S. currently favors a very big telescope because the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, where they unfolded what is kind of a technical miracle that everything worked out, gave us this bolster of saying, OK, we can build a bigger thing that we unfold. While on the European side, this idea of using more and more telescope, what is much more scalable, right? You could imagine having five telescopes or 10 or 20 or 100 yeah. if you have different rockets going up and then assemble them make more or less in a formation flying. Yeah, and you've got redundancy there as well. In case you have one redundancy fails. if one yeah. fails. Mm -hmm. And so there are two ways. And in a way, it's great that we have two different ways because that means we're going to figure out which technology works and hopefully both do. And... This is where uh, this initial dive into how you could do this when I was at the European Space Agency and this telescope that was supposed to fly in 217 uh, was the first step. Yeah, I, I think it's an extraordinary goal. Just And you, you obviously in your book, you talk often about Sagan because you are, of course, the director of the Carl Sagan Institute. And so there's a there's a natural kind of handing down of the baton there from from Sagan to you in terms of this this overarching goal of trying to answer this question of are we alone in the universe? And I think it's a goal that we've long had to take that pale blue dot image of another extrasolar planet. And yet it seems like the technical challenge will be by far the greatest thing we've ever had to do in astronomy. To, I mean, we've, we've imaged black holes, right? We've got the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope, which has taken this amazing pictures of Messier 87 and Sagittarius A star. We have these two black hole photos, which are doing interferometry, yeah. but that's on the ground. In space, it's much harder because things are moving around. I mean, the engineering challenge there must be extraordinary. 
And this is why when you want to do it in space, it's a plus and a minus. So the plus is you don't have to worry about the Earth moving. You can actually spot or look at something for as long as you want because the Earth is not rotating out of, or yeah. when the Earth is rotating, these stars go out of view with their planets. And one of the biggest challenging is to station keep, to keep those telescopes at the precise distance. And this is why we can actually only do it for the infrared because you can use visible light with its shorter wavelengths to station keep, to figure out where your telescopes are. But you cannot use this interferometric concept for visible light, where we see, because you would have to use UV to station keep, and we don't know how to do that, not really well. And so what's kind of really interesting is that there is a solution of how to do this and that we actually quite often fly things extremely precise. There were some initial um, experiments that actually showed that we could do it. Again, not the full scale. But what's interesting is we also have this mission for gravitational waves that's coming up. It's called Lisa. Lisa. Same as your name. Yeah. <laughs> and the fun go. part was like these were also when I was working on Darwin, it was the next office over. Uh -huh. And so they were actually <laughs> trying to get me to work for them yeah. because of the name. You should come here. Yeah. Yeah. It was very funny. And my boss was just saying, no, this is Darwin's Lisa, not Lisa's Lisa. <laughs> but by chance, you know, for the, for the Lisa mission, we need to formation fly perfectly as well. But the fun part is, in a way, it was never, because there's so many other technical challenges, and this mission is on its way, what I applaud fully. I think it's gonna be great to see gravitational waves with the LISA mission. But it's kind of interesting that we have to develop this technology anyway for the other missions we are flying as yeah. well. It was just such an integral part of the Darwin mission that people got cold feet, what is fair, because we had never proven it in space. And then money got a bit tight. So we wanted to prove it in space, but that also requires money. And so this is where it became shifted to the future. But I think now with what we've learned from Kepler, we actually now learned how good of a situation we are in, in a way. We have no idea if any of the planets at the right distance in this habitable zone where it's not too hot or not too cold could be habitable. But we have options. One out of five stars has such a planet, way better than if one out of a thousand stars had such a planet. So we can actually go and look at them and try to figure out how rocky planets work in the first place. I might push back a little bit on the one in five. Absolutely. I know uh, this is because I, I have to, because I know there'll be Cool Worlds fans who have probably seen, I did a video about the occurrence rate of Earth-like planets. And I, uh, it is the, I think it is pretty much the canonical number you see in a lot of these planning documents, one in five. Absolutely. But I guess my 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 reason why I would like more research to be done in that area, that's my only request, is that there's quite a lot of disagreement between different people. And so you do see some papers coming out with 1% and then other papers come out with like 90%. <laughs> there's like a very, very big range. <laughs> and I think really what it comes down to with Kepler is that as successful as it was, it didn't detect any true Earths around a true sun. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. and all of our statistics are kind of, well, these are the trends that we see. And if we kind of extrapolate those trends, then it kind of looks like one in five. But of course, extrapolation is always a little bit of a dicey game. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but I just think let's, let's just nail that number down still before we totally commit to, you know, building before we build the glass, it seems like we should probably be sure about that number. And that's a really, really good point to make because I keep talking about one out of five because if you're going for, uh, for another world that could be like ours, mm -hmm. currently all of them have red suns in the sky, mm -hmm. small red stars, right? And you were talking about this and this is something that's actually great to bring out there. When people talk about Earth-like planets, they mean so many different things. But one of the things where we actually, from Kepler and from TESS now, and from ground-based searches like Carmenes and others, and what we're figuring out that the one out of five number is pretty solid for the smallest stars. Yes. And that's where it is. But I the agree. problem is, what we were talking about before, is if you go and do interferometry, like if you're in the infrared, you can actually assess the planets around these smaller stars, and 80% of all the stars around us are these small red stars. 
but it's a completely different question. And so I'm coming when I'm talking about Darwin and the search for life, I'm coming from the idea of you can actually adjust the position of your telescopes. Thus, you can see planets that are very close to the star, like planets around red stars. That's interesting, because yeah, I think with with Louvoir and Habex, exactly. that red dwarfs are out of the exactly. question. Maybe the, maybe the orange dwarfs, but not the red dwarfs. Yeah. And this is where your question is perfect. And I also think it was great that you did this uh, podcast on the occurrence rate, because we have a pretty solid occurrence rate for the smallest stars because this is where we can find them. Yeah. Because it's faster, they have to be closer in to be warm. But extrapolating that to a yellow sun like ours is extremely difficult to do, right? Because it depends what you assume. And so if you now go to the visible, to this one telescope concept, this one telescope concept will only work or works very differently than interferometry because you cannot adjust the position of the telescopes. You don't have two, you have one. And so you need a coronagraph. You need a mass that blocks out uh, light from the star. Now, if you want to do that, the problem is that these small Earth-like or potentially Earth-like planets around red stars are very, very close to their stars. So the mask will not be the same for the big yellow suns or for the small red ones. And so we're making masks for the yellow suns because the small red suns don't have enough light in the visible to make it worth it because most of their light is in the visible infrared. And so I completely agree with you. I think it's really dangerous to just say one out of five if you throw the coolest stars out, the 80% of stars where we actually got the number from. Because then saying, oh, I'm just hoping it's also for the, for the sun -like, like analog, sun analog yellow stars. That's a huge step. But this is where when you go into the details of these different technologies to find worlds, you're starting to get into different extrapolations people make. I'm pretty confident that red stars, one out of five is a good number. I agree. But if I go and say, you want an Earth analog and that around the sun analog, and it's really crazy. I, I agree that the only place where we know there's life, right? Sample of one. But there's really, and, and there's a lot of discussion, but life itself is so versatile. So even if you say, ooh, the surface of a planet around a red sun gets like bombarded with UV radiation, oh, it would be so terrible. Well, life could adapt to that. And especially if you think that life started in water, water shelters UV radiation. It's not to say that there definitely can be life on uh, planets around red stars, but there's also nothing that really rules them yeah, out. Yeah, you can't exclude it, yeah. But this is, again, now if you go and say, what concept do you favor? One that goes to the infrared and gets all these M stars, or one that goes to the visible and gets the sun analog, right? And so in a way, it's good that we have these two paths, but you could also see how you could get into a quarrel because there are different things we don't know on both sides. We don't know how many planets there are around sun analog stars. We really don't. Kepler didn't assess that. Uh, we do know that around the small red stars, but then we have a planet around a yellow sun that has life. We haven't had one around a red star where we can find life because we haven't found life yet. There's a trade-off either way. It's a trade-off either way, but yeah. I agree with you. I think people should be much more careful with the one out of five number because it comes from the smallest stars and it's pretty open what the number will be for a yellow sun. Okay, so that's a great correction and I'm, I'm pleased that you clarified that because I learned something there that Darwin's sensitivity to M dwarfs is, is worthwhile. I actually was not aware of that. I was mostly thinking in terms of the Louvoir, Habex, the NASA view of optical. So that taught me something. So thank you for that. I want to ask you though, let's say this happens, whatever, however we do this, we somehow get these images. What are we actually looking for? What is a signature of life? What for you would be the most convincing thing? You saw this reported in a paper or you discovered it. What would be the thing that you'd be like, we're done, That's it's there. Well, I don't ever think we get to we're done, but I know where you're okay. going from. <laughs> well, that's a good, that's a good point it, as well. It's a good yeah, point. Okay. Well, one of the things is we need something that we cannot explain with anything else 
than life. And then we have to throw all our criticism on it, right? We say like, for now, we don't know, but let's try and figure out if it could be under weird circumstances, right? Because extraordinary results, as Sagan was saying, mm -hmm. extraordinary claims. claims, as Sagan was saying, require extraordinary evidence. And I fully agree with that because if we say we found life in the universe, we'd better have no other option to explain it, right? Because other than that, you can cry wolf as often as you want. And it is happening in the scientific literature that people are finding life again and again. And I get it, right? I would want to be the person who finds life. And I think there's so many people who just want to be. Uh, and they're guided by the wish that this wiggle in the spectra or this wiggle in the light curve that we find is actually something that they have been hoping for for 10, 15, 20 years, or just um, since yesterday. So there's a bias, there's, a, there's, there's potentially a, a bias. There's that, a yeah. huge bias, but I think it's every time in science, right? We try to find something and this is why we trained to be our own biggest critic. And this is why, you know, with everything that we find, we're like, okay, and now I dissect it. I take it apart. So what would for me be the sign for life? When you take and model all these different worlds, you try to figure out what could be false positives, right? Where you basically say, oh, that could be life. And it's not because geology produces a lot of different gases under different circumstances. Then you have the light of the sun hitting it. So that does photochemistry. Again, it changes the chemistry of your atmosphere. And so when you look at the earth, the combination of oxygen or ozone with a reducing gas like methane is pretty much the best combination of two gases that we cannot explain except for life. But there's some caveats, meaning that the planet has to be in this habitable zone, so warm, not super hot, because if it's super hot, you could actually split water into oxygen and hydrogen, right? So you could build up oxygen that way. Or if you have loads of CO2, you could do the oxygen that way. And this is why methane is so critical or reducing gas is so critical. Because if you, even if you just think of a planet that has like a little bit of oxygen, let's say one oxygen molecule every minute, then you wait 4.6 billion years and you'll have a lot of oxygen because nothing reacted with it. And so you would again say, oh my God, there's life. And so this is now starting to become, again, a question about technology, right? So I don't just want to find oxygen or ozone, both of them, they are basically traces of each, so that yeah. either works. I also need to find methane now. And how, how much? Because obviously there's a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, 21%, yeah. but there's hardly any methane. It's, it's like parts, yeah. some, some parts per billion, right? You probably know Absolutely. them better than I do. And so 10, uh, I think it's 10 to the minus six right now. Okay. But the key point is, even if it's just a trace gas in the atmosphere, like oxygen and methane, because when you look at different parts of the spectrum, you see different spectral features, right? So in the visible, it's reflected light. And so the light that hits the planet gets reflected back, and part of that can get absorbed by oxygen, by water, by methane. In the infrared, you heat the planet. And so then the emergent light or the emergent heat from the planet gets caught in this greenhouse gases, and methane is one of the greenhouse gases. And so how deep your feature is in the infrared actually has only partially to do with how much of it is there, and also of where in the atmosphere it absorbs, so how, what the temperature difference is. So it's punching above its weight. It's even, punching even though there's not much of way it, it's above louder its weight. than it should be. Yeah. And the interesting thing there is when you go back in time just a little bit, there was actually more methane, less oxygen. Well, there is also this really interesting, the last 500 million years where we actually think oxygen went up to about 30%. And we just wrote a paper about it, which was super fun because it had this link to the dinosaurs. Because in this area where the dinosaurs lived, there was more oxygen as far as we know. Mm. That also allowed for the huge dinosaurs, right? Because they needed more energy. Is that energy true? Because I'd always heard that that's and I wasn't sure if it was true. I don't know. That's the link that the biologists okay. and the geologists okay. tell me, right? And so the interesting thing about this is that actually 
a planet that was in this area in the Phanerozoic, there was more oxygen and there was also a bit more methane and had these dinosaurs. So the Earth during the dinosaur area would have been easier to find in terms of signs of life yeah. than now. Makes sense. And so that was the funniest part because then the journalists were asking us, so you're telling me that it's actually easier to find dinosaurs out there than humans. So I was like, well, but we're not saying that they have to be dinosaurs, right? Yeah. Which is saying it's easier. <laughs> it's too late. More the headlines. Yeah, I know. The headline's out. <laughs> Professor says dinosaurs most detectable. Oh, no, That's no. The, the, headline. the headline was even better. It was like, alien dinosaurs exist or something. And it was yeah. just like, I was like, it, it got, it got pretty weird on that the happens. internet. But on the other hand, the fun part is like my, uh, my postdoc, uh, Rebecca Payne, who, did, who, who led the paper, she was great. She was like, you know what? There's so many people who love dinosaurs and now they love astronomy too. <laughs> well, it, in the book, you actually do talk about this idea of going back in time. So it's kind of a nice connection to the dinosaurs. It makes me think of it. And I think you said that in one of your classes, you ask your students to imagine, like, what would you bring back with you back in time? And I think most people would say a camera would be like the one, well, maybe an oxygen mask, you point out, because there was well, an oxygen. They, they say camera, and I was just like, yeah. okay, you open the, the, the door of your time machine and you're dead, you know, right. <laughs> good <laughs> you, luck. <laughs> you, want some, you want something to breathe as well. And maybe maybe even at points it's toxic as well, and or too hot, so you might need a spacesuit. But... It makes me wonder if you were to go back in time and have this camera, is, is there a question in the story of life of this four billion year evolution that most bothers you where you're like, if there was one thing I could go back and, and see happen and watch happen or have my microscope available, or, or does it all make sense to you? And you're, you're kind of satisfied with the whole story, but I suspect there is something there that, that, that is an itch as an, as a, biologist, astrobiologist that's, that's making you want to go back? I think one of the things that is so fascinating is that we don't know how life started. We have all this discussion about what life is, but we do not know how to get from non-life to life. You mix the chemicals, but you have no idea how long you have to wait, what temperature you have to be at. And the really interesting thing is that it doesn't really matter to a certain extent what the surface conditions were on the Earth. It might have started on the surface in a small pond, right? It might have started on the bottom of the ocean. The discussion is strongly ongoing. It might have started in an ice shelf where on a pond or on a little kind of a little piece of water on an ice shelf that basically froze and defroze, mm -hmm. you can concentrate chemicals. So there could be a tiny niche somewhere in the earth where life started. And we don't know. We have in a way, not to say no idea, but we have, we, we do not know where that was. And that I think is a crucial ingredient, meaning that if it always takes really hot condition to get life started, or you need ice to get life started, right? It could tell us something about what we need to do to get it started in the lab. And then what you could do, you could actually mix different chemicals in and see if it gets started again. Because currently, because we cannot make life in the lab, and it's a hugely different problem, right? Difficult to, to the gills. But because we cannot make life in the lab, we also don't know if we could actually change chemistry and get life again. This is where the exploration of, for example, Titan, the moon, the really cold, cold moon around Saturn is so interesting because it's so cold that you wouldn't have liquid water. So you would have methane and ethane lakes. And could you get life in these kind of environments or is it too cold or do you need water? We don't know because we have a sample of one. So if you could give me a time machine, Doctor Who, I'm coming. <laughs> I would want to go back to the time where life started and see, you know, especially when I can get a time machine like the Doctor Who's TARDIS, exactly where it started. Because yeah. being at the right time will still not tell you where it started. You want to be at the right time and at the right spot. Yeah, I, to be honest, I always wonder, did it happen multiple times? Oh, yeah. um, it's, it's, the, the default assumption is always that it happened just once, but it, it may have been that there's thousands of instantiations which all competed with each other and we are just the the one that that you know devoured the others or whatever it was i completely agree with you i think this whole idea of the tree of life was just a beautiful concept that people actually could remember better 
this is why we think about it as a tree. But I think it's really like a lot of of different passes that could have been going on. And then one just was optimal for the conditions or for eating everything around it, right? And so when people say like, oh, if the conditions were just a little bit different, life couldn't have started. I think everything we know about life would prove that wrong because life is so incredible, versatile in adapting. So if the conditions were different, yes, a lot of times even on the earth, like 80, 90% of all life died out. And then we have this beautiful diversity of the other ones that developed further. And so I think that life started once is very unlikely as a story. I think it started under many, many different conditions and some were just once they got out of their local conditions, better in adapting. And you could see this, or you see this play out through Earth's history. First, there were this kind of life that dominated the planet, then evolution happened, another kind of life started to take over and basically pushed the earlier dominant species into tiny niches. And so I think that happens again and again. And what was really interesting, I just was at a talk by Charles Coquel. He's mm. a professor in Edinburgh. And there's this idea that I had never heard about it. And I don't know why, but so I was just at the talk that Charles Coquel, a professor in Edinburgh, gave, and he postulated something different. He postulated that in the bombardment that happened early in Earth's history, we had all these different impacts you actually generated very, very different chemical environments. You had the energy from the impact, and that could have given thousands of opportunities of life to try to evolve mm -hmm. under conditions that we might not even consider right now, because we usually don't consider like super hot and then it freezes out or... And so I thought that was interesting. And this is why my, uh, my story about going back with the TARDIS and Doctor Who to the exact right point to the exact right points where it started over and over again and it's so it's so exciting to think about so much we don't know about these questions and it's frustrating but also i think so appealing as a scientist to be in a field where there's so so much it's kind of i remember studying physics maybe you felt the same way and it a part of it feels frustrating because it kind of feels like so much of it has been figured out when you're learning like electromagnetism and classical mechanics and with the story of life on earth or even our own story of humanity anthropology there's just a vast open ocean of things that we don't know you know it, it makes me also wonder about life borrowing from each other and horizontal gene transfer we look at um, eukaryotes, right, which is this confluence of a mitochondria somehow getting eaten up by bacteria and kind of but not getting a, eaten. Yeah, but forming a, a symbiotic a symbiosis, yeah, no. relationship. And yeah, I kind of wonder if there were these many starts of life uh, on the origin of life, perhaps they were borrowing and swapping materials with each other to get to that thing that we call the lowest universal common ancestor. So it could be it could be beyond any of our imaginations what, what really happened in those early days. I think I completely agree with you. I think that fascinating diversity of what could have happened and we just scratching the surface of imagining what, what it could have been. And I think it's in science a lot of times it gets taught, as you were saying, as you go from point A to B to C. But it's really not. You go from A to F and then F didn't work out. So you go somehow you get bounced back to the other one. And so it's kind of so many different things that you get wrong to then figure out one more puzzle piece. And that's what I love about science. And yes, it is kind of frustrating sometimes to be at this part where you're like, oh, and now I would like to look up how this works and nobody has figured it out and you have to go and you do it yourself. And this is a trial and error. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't get it right. Uh, but I think this is where the search for life also helps us on other planets because there's only so much we can learn by going back in time because the rock record becomes harder and harder to read the further back you go there's less of it it has been incredibly modified and so this is where this search for life on other planets if we found signs of life on for example, all the planets that we know have been frozen at one point, or all the ones that we know have never been frozen, right? So that should also give us some pieces of trying to understand what happened here on Earth. 
And in general, the search for other Earths gives us these other puzzle pieces of how an Earth-like planet evolves. And I'm not talking about you have to have a yellow sun. I'm talking about under any sun, if you rock that has liquid water on its surface and you start to develop, whether you get to life or not, these are pieces that tell us about our own planet and our own future. So whether you care if there's life in the universe or not, it'd be interesting and good to know how our planet works better. Well, you're certainly preaching to the choir here. And obviously your, your book goes into this a lot. I have to say, by the way, the it's such an accessibly written book. I really enjoyed how, you know, you could, it assumes no knowledge. But this could be the first astronomy book that you ever pick up. And it explains things like how spectroscopy works. When How do astronomers actually probe the atmosphere of another planet? How do we detect these planets in the first place? So it assumes no knowledge, but at the same time, it has a lot of respect for the reader in terms of their intelligence. I think that's always the best writing. When you assume your reader is smart, but you also don't presume they have any prior knowledge on this particular topic. And so, it will, you know, I could give this to uh, anyone from, you know, a teenager all the way up to my grandma. And I think everybody would get a huge amount out of this book. And it keeps you up to date with everything going on in the current search. So I really did enjoy it. And you do spend a lot of time in, in the midsection of the book talking about the early Earth, which was fascinating to get into. And it made me wonder about your thoughts on rare Earth. So you, you've probably heard this idea, the rare Earth hypothesis. Absolutely. And probably some of our listeners have as well. And you talk about some of these events that happen in the early Earth's history, like the impacts you were just describing, the formation of the oceans, and then how on early Earth there wasn't even really any continents, and then the continent the continents started to form, we started to get land masses. Then we had the, you know, maybe the water was delivered from comets maybe before that, but then afterwards we start to get the rise of oxygen on the Earth due to photosynthesis emerging. You have eukaryotes emerging, which allows for these multicellular things. And so it seems like there was a lot of steps, a lot of steps. And that, when I was reading those steps, I was thinking, I wonder how Lisa feels about the rare earth hypothesis, because it seems like you're an optimist in this book. And I know you're an optimist from talking to you. And the rare earth hypothesis tends to be more of a pessimistic view. So I just was curious, how do you, how do you square that? What, what's your response to rare earth proponents? I think this idea that there's a rare earth or that not many places can actually form life is a little bit seated in this misunderstanding of the tree of life. That is just such a great picture in your head, right? And so then you can imagine, oh, the tree of life. So if you cut the part of the tree, right, the trunk, then it will never evolve. Then if you cut the, the trunk, then it will never develop. And I think this is where biology is very misunderstood because you could argue this again and again with, you know, the 90% of extinction on Earth. Life always finds a way. And life actually is all the way down to about five to 10 kilometers underground. So actually to sterilize a planet, you would have to melt it all the way down. Yes, it would have to get started again, right? Yes, it might need time, but there is so much evolution going on even around us. I think a lot of times what's hard, and this is why I built the Carl Sagan Institute, a lot of times it's hard to understand the other fields to the depth that you understand yours. And so you have to have somebody that you like comfortably can talk to. And so the Carl Sagan Institute is these 15 different departments, chemistry, biology, astronomy, physics, engineering, whatever you can imagine kind of we have, because when I go in and, for example, we had this idea, we were talking about the red suns and that there's a lot of UV hitting the surface of the planet because red suns, especially when they're young, they're very active. And so they basically push a lot of radiation on their planet. And so the astronomers are very likely, like I, I know my community well, to say, oh, there can't be any life on that planet. Go to a biologist and they say, why not? because subsurface or in the ocean, you are sheltered from UV. And also life can evolve for terrible conditions, right? Yes, you and me landing on the planet would probably be incredibly unhealthy because we never had to develop for it. And so this is what actually made me more of an optimist in this search for life. It's kind of really fun because the biologists 
whenever I come up with a question, I was like, oh, and so this will preclude life. Just like, why? I was like, oh, you know, because the sun is the wrong color. And the biologist is like, well, three quarters of life on the earth do not use sun. But of course, we are only kind of aware. This is why I run you in the book. I run you through what is life and that there's so much life that we usually don't interact with, that we don't see, that has completely different conditions and that can strive even, you know, with no sunlight. And yeah. all of this, I think, uh, adds to the rare earth hypothesis, because if you're not aware about this huge expanding knowledge, right, about what life is, what it can do, where it can actually live, then it's easy to think, oh, if the conditions are just a little bit different, everything's sterilized. You have to melt a planet down to 10 kilometers to sterilize it, right? What hopefully doesn't happen that often, even with big impacts. I agree. I try to be very balanced on this and i've i go both ways and people mm -hmm. people who've listened to me on the on the podcast and the youtube channel know that and i try to keep a very balanced view and i guess my my devil's advocate my internal dev, devil's advocate to this is that's true to like sterilize the earth now even to sterilize our spacecraft is incredibly difficult it's basically impossible like we're always going to contaminate mm -hmm. things when we fly to another planet and it was kind of fun in the book. You talk about how there's bags of uh, poop on the moon from the astronauts. <laughs> like we've and this tardigrades now sprayed yes. all over the, from this failed experiment you talk about in the book. And it's totally true. And those things are probably going to hang around there for a long time. But tardigrade or these bacteria that live deep down, they're very sophisticated machines. They're not, you know, we tend to think, well, they're, they're basic life things, but they, they have, you know, very sophisticated, they're four billion years of evolution down the line. So they're, they're complex machines that have adapted to the environment. And yes, life can adapt and will adapt to changing conditions up to a, up to a point, I suppose. But surely that's a different question to how fragile, how uh, peculiar do the conditions need to be specific to the conditions need to be for life to start i think to me maybe maybe i'm making a mistake but i try to divorce the origin of life conditions to what life can do once it gets going it seems like once life gets going it, it's almost like got a superpower right it can just pretty much adapt to anything and we don't need to worry about it. it's going to be hard to get rid of but i guess the real question is how how sp specific are the conditions on that beginning point which is the thing you wanted to go back and see Exactly. And that's exactly why I would like to go back and see, <laughs> because it is completely divorced. I agree to you. Once you have life, it seems to be incredibly good in adapting to so many different environments. But is there one specific niche that it needs to get started, right? That's the big question we don't know how to answer. And this is where the search for life on other planets will actually be a key. Because if we find signs of life on many, many different worlds, very, very different ones, then it can do it under many, many different conditions. If we don't at all, right, then the question becomes, do we just not see signs of life because it hasn't gotten to the point where it changes its biosphere with unique signatures like oxygen and methane? Before that, we had life, but it produced methane and CO2, what I can get out of geology. Or is it not there? But when I just think about the incredible amount of places that we found, one out of five stars has a planet at this right distance, where you could have liquid water and you will have some radiation hitting this planet, you have liquid water and you have different chemistry around in very different niches. I tend to be an optimist because you would have to restrict the conditions so minutely, so precisely to not have it anywhere else if there are rocks at the right distance with a similar composition, because if you look around the universe, everything is roughly similar comp composition in terms of stars and planets. But I do agree with you, as long as we do not know how to make life, uh, the answer, and this one I borrow from Michel Mayor, who is one of the two people from the first planet around the sun-like yeah. star. I love his answer. They were basically asking Michel, so what's the probability of life on another planet? And he said, 50%. And people are like, oh my God. And then he said, plus minus 50. <laughs> and he's right, right? It could still turn out that there's no life in the universe except for us. But I think the research that we have on life and its evolution 
and especially of all these extinction events and then life like rallying back and coming back suggests more that life is way more resilient or way more creative, I would say, um, than we think about when you cut off one stem or one yeah, one branch. It's like I guess it's like weeds, isn't it? You. I I would think it, weeds is a good thing. It's yeah. like a foliage, you know. Yeah. Or if you go to the, to a forest, everything that I've learned about life <laughs> since I studied this, because I'm an astronomer, so I had to learn the other part, is that it's incredible how tenacious it is. But it goes back to the question: How does it get started? And there's fascinating research that seems to indicate that what we need is actually maybe some UV radiation to get it started, to give it this additional energy, this additional kick. But there, uh, my knowledge starts to actually go out because this is where I need my colleagues to tell me what's the newest things on the evolution of life, on the origin of life, because it's incredible, it's fascinating, but it is such a fast developing field that it's really hard to uh, keep up. Yeah. So this is where we have the Carl Sagan Institute, where it just goes like, so what's new in the origin of life? And I get be, an yeah, <laughs> it's an exciting place to work with so many different colleagues. And that's why I've always been drawn to the subject as well. So you get to interact with so many different people from different backgrounds who think about these problems. And as you mentioned in the book, sometimes have different language, like you mentioned how geologists talk about glass as being cooled magma. And when they would talk to astronomers, they would be like, you mean glass? Like, like a cup? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like it was, yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, you must, you must have those kind of challenging interactions a lot at the Carl Sagan Institute. Absolutely. But this is why we implemented this coffee, because it's basically everybody sitting next to each other. And if it's kind of a more informal place, right, you can actually see yourself saying like, what do you mean by glass, right? Yeah. This is not glass, it's not see-through. <laughs> and I mentioned in the book, this was this one story where we actually were working on this and the geologists were saying, well, yeah, it produces glass. And then the astronomers in the room were like a couple, right? We're like, what? And I was like, okay, you know what? Screw this. I'm just going to ask, right? And I was like, so you mean it's a Cinderella <laughs> slipper kind of planet, right? Because I had this image of a see-through planet. I'm like, this can't work right yeah. now from anything I know. And the geologists were like, what do you mean, right? And he was like, well, you guys keep saying glass. And the <laughs> geologists were like, well, you know, oh, everybody yeah, okay. knows when yeah. you say glass, what do you mean? And I was like, what do you call this cup, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then a lot of teasing is heard, but at least we understood each other. Yeah. And this is where it's so interesting, I find too, that even if it's science, we have our own language that sometimes we don't really realize. So if you say something is big, as an astronomer, I say something is big, we think about like huge billions of kilometers. If one of my geology colleagues or like atmospheric chemist colleagues says like big, it means like one part in a million is huge, right, for a change in the atmosphere. <laughs> and so it's really worthwhile to think about the language. And when I wrote the book, that's where I wanted to come from. I also like, I want to talk to a friend of mine who has no idea who is smart or interested, right? Because as you were saying, the search for life, we are at a crossroad right now. We are at the beginning with the James Webb Space Telescope at the verge of technical possibility. It's not easy. It's going to be so hard. I don't know if we're going to find something with the telescope. We might need a bigger one, but for the first time ever, we have the possibility to investigate these small rocky worlds around these small red stars because the telescope became big enough to catch enough light. And I think there's so much bad things going on in the world, right? And sometimes it's really frustrating when you say, oh my God, you know, it's a bleak future we're going towards. But there is so much amazing things going on as well that get covered up with all these things yeah. you have to worry about. And the search for other planets that we found other worlds and that we had the verge of probing them to figure out if we're alone, to me, this is one of the huge achievements of all of us together. It's international. You need everybody in it. And I think 
if we had more of this in terms of what people actually understood what we're achieving all together, maybe we could just fix the other problems too by saying, oh, come on, we're actually finding small Earth-like planets and other yeah. stars. We can do this. It definitely changed your perspective. And I think your uh, enthusiasm and your passion for this subject, it, it it's infectious. Like it comes, to, it's always been, you know, something I've enjoyed talking with you about because you talk to Lisa about the search for life and you just come out of that conversation feeling excited about it. I always feel that way. You're very positive about it and it's uplifting to talk to you. And it really comes through in your writing as well. This is like a feel good science. <laughs> you come away feeling good about the future of science. To me, science is an adventure. And I think we are sometimes not that good in sharing it because there's so many things that are going right, even so there's lots of things that are going wrong. But I think especially the young generation, and this is why I wrote the book f for everyone. And this is why I wrote the book for everyone. So everyone can pick it up, even if you thought, ooh, science, I'm not sure if I can do this. Because there are so many voices that we need, so many thoughts that we need in the search. As I said, we have 15 departments in the Carl Sagan Institute. And sometimes the performing arts question are the ones where we're like, oh, we probably should have thought about this. Like if one of our colleagues says like, did you think about this? And we're like, oh, somehow we didn't, right? And so there's a place for everyone. But I think we also need hope because we need something to strive for. And I have this high hopes, you know, somebody is like, oh, I could like get a lot of money building weapons and do some terrible things. It was like, or I could get less money, but have a super great uh, time trying to find life in the universe. So I'm basically also trying to get really intelligent people into a different kind of profession. But I do have to say, I didn't even talk too much about exomoons in there. <laughs> <laughs> So, You're forgiven. It's okay. No, no. But the great thing about this is I was actually in a way conservative, if you think about it. Yeah. Because if you were to add extra moons as potential places for life, and there we go into sci-fi and avatar, then the chances seem to be forever in our favor. Well, it only helps. Yeah. And I know you've, I know you, the problem is you've worked on too many things. Cause I, I know, uh, when we were first, uh, working together at Harvard, uh, you were telling me about a paper you were writing about the detectability of atmospheric signatures from exomoons. I don't know if you remember that. It was This yeah. must have been like 2012, 2011. When you had just came to Howard. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, and we, st we first started talking about that subject. And yeah, so I appreciate that you, you definitely are an advocate of exomoons. And uh, uh, I think, obviously, I'm pleased to have seen that paper. And of course, the thing that you're, I think that you've been working on really hard over the last few years, and you do talk about in the book as well, is this color catalog, which is, it's kind of a beautiful idea, the idea of just what is the basic color and hues of the planet and how do they evolve and blend into each other and change, which it's certainly in the, on the East Coast and Northeast, you see that changing hues of, with the seasons. But on a longer time scale, there's changing hues of the entire planet. What was the, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what this catalog is and how your team are trying to use it to answer these questions. One of the really interesting things, so first I thought about the Earth evolving through time. And we are looking, or we were looking, for a carbon copy of Earth. So that means 21% oxygen and some green plants, basically. But if you just look, this is when you go to the diversity of life on the earth, you see that there are so many different places that have so many different kinds of life. But a lot of them are colorful because pigments do a lot for you. So pigments is the expressed color, right? And they can actually help stressed organisms protect themselves. So then the idea well, actually, I was at Yellowstone National Park, and I saw all these beautiful colors. And then somebody said, it was like, you know what, this is all different kinds of life. You know, when you go from the outside to the inside of this hot sulfur, um, sulfur springs. And I was like, what, what do you mean? This is all different kind of life. Of course, it's all different kind of life, but it never clicked. Is it all bacteria or is it all di protozoa? It, it's all different yeah. kind of, it depends a little bit what the temperature range is. But it's very versatile, different thermophiles, you know, if they're closer. But the interesting thing was, I was like, hey, um, 
I don't think we know what that would look like in my telescope. And then I looked around desperately, right, everywhere, and I went through the literature, and it turns out we don't. And so this idea, again, that we are it, or are we are looking for us, right? It's like the, it's, it's a little bit like the Earth being the center of the universe, right? Now we're trying to find Earth around a yellow sun, right? We want green plants. But it's like, but the diversity even on our planet shows us how different it could be, right? Just change the conditions a little, and maybe some other kind of things would have been dominant life forms, or you would have purple vegetation, you know, under a red sun, because it would absorb more of the light and reflect less. And so we made this color catalog of life. It's basically just to say, if you have a variety of different kind of life forms from microbiota to something more advanced, single cellular to more advanced maths and structures, how would that actually look like? So if you saw it in your telescope, if light reflected it, um, or if it reflected light, incoming starlight back to your telescope, what would it look like? And the fun, interesting thing is that this color hues of life are so diverse and beautiful. And it's basically like you take a cosmic paintbrush and you pick any color and you probably find an organism that uses those pigments. And the next question, so now we've, we've established this catalog and there's so many more ways to go. And I always call it bag, bore and steal because we don't have much money for this work. So I always like whenever I meet a biologist was like, so do you have something left over that you might want yeah. to send me and I can grow it and I can look what it would look like in my telescope because most biologists don't do that, right? They don't really care yeah. at a certain point uh, what the color is because it's not so useful for them. And so we have this amazing collaboration with people all over the world who are like, yeah, sure. I have like five things I can send you. And so we're now getting this FedEx box boxes. It's super funny. We get this FedEx boxes in the astronomy department and then we just run them <laughs> to the fridge because you can do this overnight, right? And this thing will survive. You know, it's not all extreme of us. It's just whatever we can get our hands on because the diversity of life on our planet should inform our search for life, surface life, right, on other planets. And so we go uh, to the biologists, so Carl Sagan Institute, combination of different departments. But so we have a lab in the biology department. And my postdoc, Ligia Coelho, is an amazing researcher. She can grow this. She's a microbiologist. She can grow it. And then we basically take this beautiful, colorful flasks of different kind of life. And then we put it in a rucksack and we walk half of our campus to the remote sensing <laughs> lab where another colleague of mine actually has a setup where we can put those different biota. We usually put them on a filter, right, to, just to have like a, a solid line of biota, not just the flasks. And then we uh, hit it with light and see what it reflects back. And it's really funny because it's like we go from this one department to the other department and then yeah. we use the information and we put it into our models for other Truly planets. interdisciplinary. Truly yeah. interdisciplinary, <laughs> full out. And, yeah. uh, but it's, it's And then it gets added to your catalog. So you just go, yes. you take all these different examples of life and catalog their colors. And this forms a sort of basis set for which we can then go out and exactly. search for these signatures. And we call it color catalog, but it's really the reflection of the light at different wavelengths, right, for this wide diversity of biota. And the interesting thing is like we call it color catalog of life and it's available online at the Carl Sagan Institute website. Anyone can use it for all the other things they want to use it for. And for example, one of the things that's very interesting is we have life in ice. It's one of the questions that we were asking is like if we had an icy world or if you had an icy moon, what could be things we should look for? What are the patterns, reflectivity patterns we should look for? Because we know life can strive in ice and snow. And so now this is also something that's really important for climate change. Because one of the problems is if the glaciers or the ice actually gets less reflective because biota actually lifts there more and more, it brings down the reflectivity and thus it melts the glaciers faster. And this is why this color catalog of life, we use it for something, 
trying to find life in the universe, but it's there for everybody to use for whatever they want. And in case you're listening to this podcast and you want to send me a sample of an interesting life kind of organism that you have, you know, just let me know. Look me up on the internet. There's nothing dangerous. Nothing dangerous. <laughs> nothing dangerous. That is very true. Even so, my microbiologist knows what to do. But yes, nothing seriously dangerous. Yeah, you kind of um, worry about people sending stuff in the mail. That immediately disturbs me. But uh, That's true. I, no. Yeah, I talk, hope. Talk to I us hope, first. Yeah, I hope these FedEx packages are... Uh, I'm sure they're handled carefully, but, but yeah, it's a wonderful resource that you've given to the community to help us in this quest. You mentioned there the possibility of, of life in icy worlds, which I think is just such a, especially someone who's interested in moons, that seems particularly fascinating. And you talk about the prospects of life in the solar system. You mentioned sort of Mars as an obvious place people have looked at for a long time, but also Europa and Enceladus, which have got increasing interest. And we have these missions, there's the Europa Clipper, and juice, which I think are fairly similar timelines of the mid 2020s, a week's no mid 2030s, mid 2030s, there. mid 2030s, yeah, because it's mid 2020s now. So mid 2030s, we have these missions arriving. Are they going to do anything for the search for life, or, or are they more or less setting the stage for future missions? I think to a certain degree, they're setting the stage for future mission, except, and this is where this interest in our life in ice is going. And so one of my uh, postdocs, Ligia Coelho, that I mentioned before, uh, she's developing this into, now what about if in our solar system, we had such pigments, life in ice? could you actually observe it in the ice? Because that's one of the ideas people have is to look at the structure at the surface where the cracks are for the icy moons. Well, there is this red stain with Europa, isn't there, that you exactly. get in the, in, the, in the cracks and also on the, I think they're called lenticuli, right. the little spots, yeah. And the question is, can you explain all of this, right, with geology or with kind of minerals? Or is there some kind of pigment that might have exactly the same color, right? But if you have enough of a resolution in wavelengths, so when you actually look carefully enough, what you can when you're there, could you actually tell apart that this is a reddish kind of rock feature or a reddish kind of pigment that life on the earth makes? And these are some things that we're investigating. And this is where this research can hopefully help missions uh, get a first idea of, uh, you know, if they're spotting broken pieces of life, broken pieces of pigments, or pigments in the icy, uh, icy worlds in our solar system. So you don't, you don't mention Venus, and obviously Venus has been a subject, which surprised, you know, I think to many of us it was surprising that there was astrobiologists interested in Venus, given what a extreme environment it has. But maybe I can ask you, sort of out, outside of the books it's not in the book but what is your thoughts on the the recent interest in possible life on venus i think venus is really important and interesting because it's just somewhere between earth and venus uh planets lose their water and so at that point we have a limit of what we call this habitable zone it doesn't mean that there can be life outside of it, but if you can fly there to investigate, we won't be able to tell because it doesn't sufficiently, a biosphere doesn't sufficiently change the atmosphere. And now when you go to Venus, I think it was actually a beautiful example of the excitement of trying to find life in our solar system and our holes in our knowledge. Because Venus wouldn't be a place where you would expect life to be able to thrive right now. Even if it's incredibly good in adapting, at Venus you would actually have to make it somehow get up in the atmosphere into a part of the atmosphere where it's just the conditions are, are okay for life as we know it. And so the excitement was the convolution of where they sought they found signatures that could identify life because it was at this cloud layer where you could say, oh, you could actually have a surface, right? Because clouds are particles. So there was a confluence of, uh, of hopeful ideas that could give you this one opportunity of maybe finding life on Venus. And just background here, we're talking about phosphine. We're talking about phosphine, Because we haven't Sorry. maybe yes. given that no. pointedly, but there was a claim of phosphine, yes. which is a possible biosignature in the right. claimed in the atmosphere of Venus. And so the big problem is there we go back to 
does it have to be biological, right? So I've been talking a lot about extraordinary claims. Uh, and we had the situation on Mars too, right? With the methane on Mars. Of course, I wish it to be life, right? But the problem is if I have 99 explanations that are, don't require life and one that requires life, as a scientist, I'm unfortunately trained to not just jump on the last one. But I do get that people want it to be the last one, even scientists, right? Sometimes you're like, oh my God, this would be like the best ever explanation. And I think what was really great about Venus is that people now updated their Venus models, right? Because the Venus models were just not, and it's not anybody's fault, but you just have that much time. There's not much money usually for Venus models. And so this actually kick-started uh, the community's interest in Venus. Again, uh, updated models kind of showed that the cloud layers wouldn't be where they start the Venus observations, the phosphate observations were, what is now starting to become more and more tricky to try to now actually, because Venus, phosphate somewhere in the atmosphere is not as compelling as phosphate, at a, as, a, as phosphate detections at a place where you could have some kind of surfaces like a cloud layer. Oh, so it just needs something to stick to, basically. The, if yeah. you want it to be life, uh, okay. you might want to have something. It, it's not just free floating particles. The argument was that there could be some kind of organisms that would produce it because they were stuck on the, uh, on the surface of these clouds. But I think what it showed is this excitement and I think it took the scientific community generally by surprise that these observations and then these ideas where they could come from uh, formed such an excitement in the general population too about trying to find life. Um, I think what it did, what I think is great, is it actually allowed us to investigate this further. So there were more observations that some of them did not find phosphine at all. Some of them are not sure. They found out some issues with the pipeline. So this thing that actually develops the observation to a certain point for us, for us scientists before we analyze them. Um, but uh, it gave a reason for us to go back to Venus and study it more that we might not have gotten by just saying, oh, come on, we need to learn about Venus because somewhere between the Earth and the Venus, habitability as we know it starts to fade and we don't know where. And so learning more about Venus will give us some information on that. I don't think, and this is why it's not in the book, I don't think the phosphine detection on Venus is as solid as we hoped it would be. And thus, I haven't put it in because it would have required a couple more chapters about yeah, yeah. this. And the fun part is like my editor was like, no, <laughs> you have this page number. And I was like, OK, the most important things. No, are it's in totally there. appropriate. I wasn't. It's hard to cover and give it due diligence and not uh, you, you want to be fair to, to all the sides. And so that takes a lot of pages to cover. So I totally understand why it wasn't included. I think the interesting thing to me about the story of Venus is the uncertainty that we have about a planet in our own solar system when it comes to the question of life. And we've seen that before with Mars, uh, with the methane, but also with the um, Alan Hills meteorite that Bill Clinton, and you mentioned in the book, stood on the White House lawn and said, this, you know, this could be evidence for life. And even before that, we had Percival Lowell, one of my favorite stories, imagining canals on the surface of, the, of Mars. So people have been claiming life in the solar system, was that at least four times now, probably even more than that if we go through the history books. And yet in all of those, well, maybe the the uh, the case of the canals, we can scratch, scratch that off as sorted, but pretty much the other three are still kind of unresolved to some degree. And do, is, that, is that a reason to be worried in the search for exoplanets? If we can't conclusively figure out what's going on with potential biosignatures on our two neighboring planets, where we can send probes, we can you can visit these things, we can put orbiting satellites. How are we going to do it for a pale speck of light that's light years away? I completely agree with you that we need a strategy. And the problem is we also need to agree to a strategy, what always will be the biggest problem. 
And so, for example, there were some recent claims of a wiggle in one of the spectrum of an extrasolar planet that is a mini Neptune. So it's a gas ball. It's super hot. I know exactly what you're talking about. But yeah. there was a small wiggle, right? And then the scientists were very excited about that this wiggle could mean more than it is, right? And the statistical significance was also unfortunately not there. We usually say... It has to be three times bigger than the noise, right? For us to say we find something that was like 1.2 times bigger than the noise, but I can get it, right? Somebody was like, oh, I could have found life, right? I want to claim this, you know, I get it. And so I think uh, it's not just uh, our own solar system and people claiming life, right? I think we just have to get used to it that somebody claims life or cries wolf, right? And then... People come together and say, like, look, right, these are rules that it doesn't come up yet. It's not to say it's not life, but it is not the extraordinary evidence that we actually as a community require to say so. And so what I think will happen is that there will be a lot of people claiming life with these wiggles and these detections of light from extrasolar worlds. And some of them might in the long term actually teach us something about chemistry we never understood. Because one of the problems, and this is where the catalog, uh, the color catalog of life came from, is that if you only look for green plants, you'll miss a lot of other options, right? But you also want to mistake anything that's at that wavelength where the green plants would reflect. And you, you won't immediately think about, oh, it could be chemistry. Oh, it could be geology. It could be a mineral, right? Because your view is there is green plants or nothing. And so I think by widening our approach for life and for its signatures, and also being more aware that there could be some false positives, I think what we're teaching ourselves is to be cautiously optimistic, but maybe not to cry life every time we think that we find a wiggle that we can't explain, but it's, it's everybody's it's personal thing. I kind of go back and forth on it a little bit. I know it's easy to sort of poo-poo the scientists who say this and, and not too many people come to their defense. And I'm not trying to defend these scientists necessarily, but I do think it's hard if you see something in your data that is consistent with X, there's some certain biosignature, but it's, but it's marginal. It's maybe two sigma, as you said, not normally the threshold. What do you do with that? Do you not publish it? Do you just say, I'm going to kind of keep this to myself as a little top secret thing? that Because that, that feels anti-scientific to not to, to say that there's a, you've got this evidence for something. But at the same time, it's unlike any other scientific topic that just the, the very mention of the word biosignature, two sigma detection of biosignature, to us, we understand as scientists, that means basically ignore it. But that could so easily get picked up, and it does get picked up and get sensationalized, that others would say, you know, we can't trust, we basically can't trust the media or even the public to some degree to digest this. And so we have to sort of censor it. And that's where I get conflicted, because I don't feel comfortable censoring, even if it was 1.2 sigma of DMS, Dimethyl sulfide in this case, the case we're talking about. I, I feel that's obviously not statistically significant of, of a life detection, but do they not also have an obligation as a scientist to put that in there? That's where I, that's where I go back and forth in my head. How do you feel about that? Absolutely. So I have no problem whatsoever in actually putting it in there because I think we should. Um, even so, one of the problems with such a small signal is that if you do Bayesian statistics, and you do, right, retrieval, it's like if you tell the code that it's something is in there, you know that there's a certain thre threshold that it will tell you it's there even if it's not. And so 1.2 is not above that threshold. So it basically tries to find a solution to uh, accommodate your guess that it could have been there. So you have to be very careful. But no, absolutely, this data needs to go into a scientific paper. And the scientific paper actually did it right. The scientific paper just said that there was a hint of 1.2 for dimethyl sulfur, right? The problem was the press release they added to it. And I think one of the things we have to learn as scientists 
I think especially in this case and in many other cases, the enthusiasm of having been the person to find something sometimes takes over. And it is not fair to assume that the public will understand what this means. This is where, as scientists, we are communicators, right? And so what I should say, or what I would say, and what just went out of context in this context, for example, and again, I don't blame the scientists for putting this in, but I do have a choice when I talk about something to be uh, less enthusiastic about it, right? To say, look, this is really exciting, but currently the data is just not there yet, but we're going. And I think that was lost in terms of nuance. Again, not necessarily the scientist's fault, but I think the press release was incredibly unfortunately structured. And I think as a scientist, we have to figure out that we are communicators. You cannot just say, well, they wrote a press release. I said it was fine, and then this happened. You... When you read a press release, you have to also think about what this probably will lead to, you know, as good as you can. And sometimes you cannot anticipate what's happening. Yeah, I think, well, I might be misremembering, I thought the, I only saw the NASA press release. Yeah. I, I didn't feel like I overbaked it, but I, I agree with the way the media picked it up. And I'm, I'm certainly cognizant of that with ExoMoons. We've, when we first made our ExoMoon candidates, we didn't really, it's not that we didn't believe that they were real, but we were very cautious about their reality. I would exactly. say it's probably the right way to describe it. And so we we tried to emphasize that, exactly. but there's still, there's, I kind of learned there's almost nothing you can do, no matter how cautiously you frame it in interviews, it's still, there will be headlines. There's, it's all, it, and that's very frustrating as a scientist that you feel somewhat powerless to control the message. That's why I kind of love doing the, the podcast and, the, the YouTube channel because it gives me a chance to like talk directly, not through an intermediary. Because if, if I learned anything about science communication is that the intermediaries rarely do a good job of translating uh, the science. There are some very good ones, but so often, so often there's terrible <laughs> examples. And so I, I have some sympathy on both sides, I guess. And it's, um, it's, it's an unresolved problem. And it seems like with life, there's something special about that case. It's always gonna get a lot of attention. I agree to a certain extent. So I think the problem is also we are not trained to communicate, right? As a scientist, we're not trained to tell you, oh, you know what, 1.2 sigma doesn't mean what you think it means, right? Just like uh, this detection, if it can be substantiated, would be super interesting, right? But I do think that um, there's a lot of people who are trying to communicate it the right way. The journalists I generally work with, they want to get the story right. And so a lot of times what I get to ask is like, can you just send it back to me? Let me just read it, right? Because there's a lot of things that are easy to misunderstand because I know this stuff and I might not have explained it right. And so in a way, that's also where the book comes from, to give people a little bit of um, a tool to say, okay, so now what do I need to check, right? And it's like, okay, if somebody says, oh, I found life on this, it's like, is this a rock? right? Is there actually a surface where life could get started? Yes, no, right? And then if there's not, like a mini Neptune, then interesting, but from everything we know so far, probably not the best contender. And so I hope this is when some of the journalists are like, so what can I read? Or have you written a book so I can read up on this, right? This is a book. This is like, I can now send you the PDF, right? It's like, look through this, look through this chapter. And I hope that will help. But I think it, it will with time, people will understand the nuances. Like for example, now, you know, with meteorites, right? Um, second time around, people were like, but could it be this and this and this? I take it in a positive spin that the excitement is there, right? The excitement is there and we just waiting for it to be a true signature for life. Unfortunately, sometimes we're gonna get it wrong, but in a way we can also teach people that that's okay. Science gets it wrong and then it adjusts. Yeah, I appreciate you. You are very cautious in this book, and absolutely not sensationalist. So that's certainly something I appreciated. When maybe she does. When does this? When does this book come out? Sixteenth of April. Okay, so not too long. And what was the what was the inspiration for you to write this book? What drove you to do it? I had a sabbatical coming up, and I was thinking about 
trying to figure out, because I work on many different aspects of the search. And the easiest way to think about it for me and to see if I've actually collected all the connected all the dots that I think are important is to write it down in a very simple way. And so this is where the idea was born that I'm going to write a popular science book. Because if I talk to a friend about this and I say, look, this is important and this is important. And so I sketched it out. And one of the things that um, Rob Hazen, who's another person who writes science books, so I just chatted with him. I was like, well, you know, how do you write a science book? And he was like, put a small chair in front of you and I was like why and imagine the friend you're talking to so you don't forget <laughs> that you're actually talking to a friend because that's the best way of writing it and I was like I also in a second farm wrote this book so other scientists in their field please write a book like this so I can actually learn as much as I can about other fields in a deep dive without having to know something. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I wish, you know, that we had this on gravitational waves, See? neutrino physics, colliders. Exomoons. This would be wonderful. Yeah, we, <laughs> You uh, have something to do in your sabbatical. Right, exomoons. I, I mean, seriously, yeah, that's uh, that'd be fun to write a book at some point. So let me finish off because we're coming up to the end of our time. But you, you know, in this book, you obviously, you write very passionately about the fragility of our own planet. You've spoken eloquently about how you feel today, how science could be you know, a unifying thing that can give us maybe some hope and optimism about the future of our planet and the future of our society. And in a way that kind of carries the message and the torch of Carl Sagan, who was not just an optimist about the search for life in the universe, but also a humanist. And he saw it as part of our journey as a species to try and answer these questions. So I was kind of curious just to finish, what impact has maybe not just the work of Sagan, but your own work as a scientist, how has it altered you in going from that student who was working on Darwin, you know, and doing these cancer experiments to writing this book? Um, how has the search for life in the universe changed you? What it has given me is an incredible appreciation of how incredibly wonderful, bizarre and weird our planet actually is. Things I had never thought about, like, for example, what life can do in all these different niches, how eukaryotes, you know, was just like engulfed something and all of a sudden there was new life. And now when I look up at the sky, this cosmic connection, that there might be somebody else looking out and wondering if they're alone. All of this to me makes my view of just looking at my surrounding or looking at the night sky so much more profound and deeper. It's a little bit like a painting that you love. And then when you know why it was made, who made it, what are the tools to do it, it gets this additional depth. And for me, my view of the world now is just more in depth than it was before. And I can look at a piece of moss, for example, right now and say, oh my God, there might be like tardigrades in there and I can imagine how they look like in their dew drop. And I can look up at the sky and I imagine the stars, these huge gas balls igniting and allowing the light to hit the potential planet and maybe have life start there too. That's beautiful, yeah. It has it shifts your mindset. You see the world differently. Yeah. So Lisa, this has been wonderful. For those who uh, are interested in learning more about the search for life in the universe, I recommend this book, Alien Earth. It's really fantastic, beautifully written, informative and very accessible and keeps everyone up to date and, and also down to earth on the search for life out there. So please check that out. And thank you, Lisa, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So that was my conversation with Lisa Kautenegger. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It's always wonderful for me to get to catch up with Lisa because frankly, we just go a long way back. As you heard on the podcast, we were at Harvard together, not as students, but as postdocs, both as active researchers looking for exoplanets and even starting to think about their search for life in the universe back then. But 
more than that, we just got to chat on a regular basis. On coffees every morning, we would get to chat about the various latest exoplanet news. And also, I remember heading over to her apartment a couple of times for parties that she held. So she's always been a good friend of mine, and it's really wonderful to see her blossom into this incredible scientist. And now she's the director of the Carl Sagan Institute, and she's written this wonderful book, which, by the way, is out now, Alien Earth, so you can find it on amazon.com or your local bookstore wherever you get your books from go check it out we obviously record this episode what probably a month or two ago but i thought we should save off releasing this until the book comes out to kind of give it like an extra bump so go check that out right now you know i think leaving this conversation i have to say the one thing that i'm left with as a feeling about the search for life in the universe is obviously something i think a lot about and my feelings on it do sway day to day, as I think many scientists do. But the feeling I'm left is with just thinking about that solar system example of phosphine with Venus and how incredibly challenging and difficult it is to make sense as to whether there is potentially a signature of life on a planet that is literally next door. I mean, you, there is no planet closer than Venus to the Earth. And yet even in that case we still are arguing and fighting about whether what we saw was really life or not. That's humbling, right? That's humbling because it makes you realize that one day when we build Darwin or TPF or Louvoir or the Carl Sagan Observatory, maybe, whatever it will be called, when we build this telescope that will hopefully be capable of detecting these kinds of signatures, that is not going to be the end of the story. There will surely be a huge amount of work that's going to have to come after that. But it will be the beginning of a very exciting journey of getting our first hints of potentially life in the universe. Maybe we'll find nothing. Who knows? But if it does find those first hints, it is still just the beginning of a very long journey of hard science, figuring out how the chemistry, the geology of other exoplanets work. And I think we will learn a lot in that process. It's a lot of hard work, but hey, that's what science is. And I'm certainly looking forward to getting into that hard work and seeing those first hints or absences, who knows, of what else might be out there. So if you enjoyed this podcast, if you're enjoying the previous conversations we have had, then and you want to support us, then the best way to do that is to head to coolworldslab.com slash support. That's coolworldslab.com slash support. If you do that, if you head over there and you pledge to become a donor at various monthly levels, you are supporting really the research team directly, which in turn supports the podcast and the outreach videos. The way this works is that your money basically just goes to research funding exclusively here at Columbia University. You know, we use that to publish papers, to do research, to hire researchers, that kind of stuff. And then that means I have to write less grant proposals. And that means I have more time to do podcasts, to do the outreach videos as well. So I think it's a unique proposition to you guys that if you do want to support us, you are not only supporting real research in the field of astronomy and astrophysics and the search for life in the universe, but you are also supporting all of the outreach work that we do at the same time. So if you're interested, please do check that out, coolwoodslab.com slash support. So until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious.